fun event, and I've been doing this for the past few years. We did our first show back in 2012 with about 250 people. There's a few more here today. Uh, I look at conferences, having worked at conferences one form or another for the past 20 years, as one of the few times we really get to think about the leadership of our careers as opposed to the management of our careers. Most of the time we're managing our career, doing what we need to do, get the work done, an important thing to do. But you got about a week this week, especially if you were at the workshops. Think about where you're going, what you want next. And we've kind of put out a buffet for you to try some stuff. If you've looked in your show guide, you know there's a lot of sessions, a lot of different things to go to. So I would suggest to you, taste as many things as you can. Try on stuff you haven't ever looked bef at before. Uh, and maybe you'll get a new idea. Take something back to the office that could change the way you do some work, do a little more, uh, change directions. There's all those possibilities in those sessions. These sessions are for you. If it's not working for you, do not hesitate to change sessions. Don't feel obligated to have to stay in here. Not this one, you stay for this one. <laughs> but in a regular session, uh, if you think there's something else going on you'd like to take a look at, you absolutely should. Everybody will be fine with that. We're here for you. Without you guys, we don't exist, not the other way around. This is one of my favorite keynotes in the world. I've been working with Mr. Guthrie now for entirely too long. Uh, I remember him as a very young product manager at Microsoft making a product called ASP.NET. And uh, you do a few more things these days, a few more people. Uh, my fav one of my favorite memories of yours, actually in Orlando, you keynoted a conference, then we did a Q&A session at .NET Rocks with about 500 people, then you and I had coffee, which I was grateful for, we talked about the strange loop, and then you ran off to do a user group with about 50 folks over at the Space Coast. And I think it's one of the thing reasons that you're amazing at this, is that you're always getting as much input as you can from everybody. So I appreciate you, sir. Folks, this is Scott Guthrie. Cool. People hear me okay? Great. I'll confess I am fighting off a cold, so if I cough and I blow out your eardrums, I apologize in advance. I'm gonna to try to cover the microphone when I, and if I do cough. Uh, but I wanna say a big thank you for everyone coming out here today. And it's a real treat uh, for me to be able to uh, be back here uh, with so many people. And I'm looking forward to spending the time this morning uh, talking to you. If we could change to machine A, that has my slides, perfect. Um, that way you also see what I'm talking about. Uh, um, as was mentioned, my name is Scott Guthrie. I run our cloud and enterprise group at Microsoft. So that includes uh, a lot of Visual Studio, .NET. It also includes Azure, uh, our data products, and uh, a few other things. And the thing I was gonna talk about this morning is around kind of mobile first, cloud first development. And around what I think is sort of one of the most exciting times that our industry has ever been through which is the opportunity for all of us to build these amazing applications that can run in users' pockets, and then they can run all over the world. And I think, and I say this often, but I don't think it's ever been a better time to be a developer than it is right now. And I hope uh, as I walk through some of what you can do and, and uh, some of the demos of the technology that you can take advantage of, you know, I hope you leave pretty energized about that as well. I thought I'd actually start by just talking about a couple of examples of the types of apps that I think all of us have an opportunity now to build these days. Uh, and these are apps that kind of span different industries, target different types of customers, but I think kind of speak to the huge possibilities that are opening up for all of us inside this industry. And uh, these are all customers that I've been able to work with uh, that are running on top of Azure and on top of our cloud today. And all have kind of both a mobile and a cloud-based element as they're building their solutions. First one here is BMW. How many people here have a BMW? How many people would like a BMW? Look under your seat, no. Uh, <laughs> uh, I wish. Uh, I don't have a BMW either, but I aspire someday to have one. Um, one of the things that BMW's done uh, that's pretty cool is with all their new cars, they're really taking software and infusing it into their vehicles and really trying to transform the overall car ownership experience. And so if you have a BMW today, or even if you've bought one in the last year, they're updating it uh, over the wire, you know, they now actually have kind of an immersive dashboard experience that's directly in the vehicle uh, and provides an embedded experience that connects uh, to the user uh, who's driving the car, knows their preferences, knows their, knows their profiles, can, can integrate with their data. 
And they've also built a set of mobile companion applications that go with it so that every driver literally in their pocket can unlock their car, can actually see the telemetry on their car and have a much more immersive car ownership experience. And the cool thing about the team that built this was they went from idea to actually shipping it in less than a year. And they've been able to sort of update it not just once but continuously where they do updates that they push out to every BMW car on average every three weeks uh, since they launched it back in April of this year. And it's kind of a great example of kind of how this cloud and this mobile world are really fusing together to enable some new scenarios. You know, AccuWeather is another uh, pretty well-known brand out there that a lot of people that have a weather app on their device uh, know and use. I think they're the number one weather app in the world uh, based on usage. And you know, again, it's another great example of a company uh, that basically built their entire solution in a very agile way. Uh, they take advantage of .NET, they take advantage of Visual Studio um, on their development practices, and they're using Azure on the back end to basically scale out this solution and run it all over the world. And they now process about 18 billion unique weather requests uh, from both consumers and then also from businesses that want to be able to get supply chain information uh, and be able to use weather to incorporate uh, updates in terms of their inventory so they know if there's a storm coming, they buy blankets and things like that. Uh, and again, it's a great example of fusing mobile and making it available for everyone in the world to use, but then also building out a back end that uses data that can take advantage of cloud infrastructure to literally run all over the world and do amazing things. And these scenarios aren't, aren't just around consumers. You know, this next one I'll talk about briefly is Rolls Royce, uh, which for people that flew here to Vegas, which is probably almost everyone in the audience, there's at least a 50% chance that the aircraft you were in was using and powered by a Rolls-Royce engine. And they're kind of one of the iconic manufacturers in the world. And they deliver, obviously, you know, their customers are airlines. And one of the things that they've been doing now is taking advantage of IoT and taking advantage of cloud-based infrastructure and analytics to be able to provide to their customers, which are airlines, much richer uh, uh, field maintenance services on top of the engines, the ability to anticipate when an engine might have problems and be able to do pro preventative repair on top of it, and then also the ability to provide to the airline ways that they can save money in terms of fuel efficiency and fuel economy uh, by helping pilots actually fly the aircraft more efficiently. And it's a great example of what you might think of as an internal-based IT application that they're being able to kind of embed inside their product and deliver to customers all over the world. And again, they were able to go from concept to actually reality in about six months um, from starting the project and they're seeing huge success with it out there. And then the last one I thought I'd talk about is a little fun, since I think, does anyone here watch The Walking Dead? One person, okay. <laughs> uh, well, if you, don't, if you don't watch it, which I guess is everyone else, um, I guess there was a big surprise this week, which I won't spoil, uh, but it's one of the more popular TV series out there. And um, there's a cool company, which I'll, I'll kind of talk more about uh, in one of the demos later today. Uh, that builds the online game experience around The Walking Dead. It was actually the number one app in the Apple App Store, which is a pretty big deal uh, when you're at the number one level. And uh, they provide updates pretty much every week based on the new shows that come out. And it's a great company that's based in Europe. And they've been able to build this entire infrastructure that's all mobile-based, stream it to users all over the world. Again, have a super fast, agile workflow uh, and be able to kind of make decent money, good money uh, with it. Uh, again, by taking advantage of this mobile first, cloud first based development uh, paradigm. Uh, and we'll show a fun video of it later. So these are just sort of four examples of the types of things, whether it's consumer, whether it's around direct to customer, whether it's internal to businesses uh, that people are doing in this mobile first, cloud first world. And our focus at Microsoft and the, the, a lot of the demos you'll see throughout today is how do we enable all of you in this audience to be able to take advantage of that and to be able to build amazing solutions, both that delight your customer, whether they're inside your company or outside your company, but also end up being really fun as a developer to actually use uh, and can really provide an even more rewarding career for all of us in this room. One of the things I'll talk about, uh, I want to start by talking about is, you know, the, the purpose of the cloud and how all this fits together. So we're going to, the first couple demos I'm going to do are very focused on mobile development. But, you know, I think one of the things that, that we certainly are seeing is the usage of, of cloud for not just 
web and other scenarios, but specifically for mobile, is something that uh, is going to be the dominant way that you build these types of experiences going forward. And when we think about the journey to the cloud that pretty much every organization is looking to take, uh, it's a big journey. And for all of you out there that work in companies, especially larger companies or companies that have been around for several years, that journey entails multiple different things. It entails figuring out your business applications and your productivity applications and how do you take advantage of a SaaS-based world. It's about taking advantage of potentially public cloud infrastructure to run your applications and build new solutions. It's about taking advantage of data and intelligence in deeper ways. Uh, and that journey typically requires you to manage all of this holistically so that you can maintain security and you can actually uh, depend on this to run your business. And our kind of approach across Microsoft has been, how do we enable you to do each of these things in isolation? But then also, how do we enable you to compose these things together into what we call the Microsoft Cloud? That gives you kind of that platform that you can build these types of experiences and do it in what we call a global, trusted, hybrid way. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about this, and then we'll dive into a whole bunch of demos. One of the things that we focused a lot on with our cloud is, is to have a truly global cloud. And so we have uh, built out now data centers and infrastructure pretty much all over the world. And so these little blue dots here on the screen represent what we call Azure regions, which are typically clusters of multiple data centers that we put close together. Uh, and then we make it look like one giant data center that you can deploy and run your code in. And so literally each of these blue dots is a place where you can write code in whatever language you want, using whatever operating system you want, to target any device you want, and you can literally in seconds deploy code and reach that audience around the world. And you know, what's nice about these, these little blue dots is not just that they're scattered all over the world, which means that you can compete in any market, but they also have in them the raw horsepower and infrastructure necessary to pretty much scale to any application scenario, uh, including all the ones that I talked about at the beginning there. And what I wanted to do is just show a quick video that gives you kind of a sense of what one of these blue dots looks like. And so there'll be a number of statistics for this particular blue dot that I'll show, this one region. But just realize that's just one of these 36 regions around the world, each of which is where you can deploy your code. So let me watch, roll the video. So these regions are big and they're global and they run everywhere. And the other thing that we focused on with these regions is how do we not just provide you with that scale, but the ability for you to really run your business on them and to deliver solutions in a really trusted way. And so one of the things that we focused on as building out our infrastructure is you know, providing a trusted cloud that you can really depend on. You know, as part of that, we've done a whole bunch of things around certifications and compliance so that you can compete in pretty much any market uh, if you want to sell to the government, you can sell to the government. If you want to sell uh, to um, finance, you can sell to finance uh, customers. If you want to participate in the food industry, we're FDA certified, et cetera. Um, and that gives you kind of, again, the ability to kind of compete on this global level, but do so also in a way that allows you to know that you can kind of enter any market and you can sell any type of solution with it. We've also focused with Azure quite a bit on security, obviously. And security is a multifaceted thing where we need to focus on security, not just at the infrastructure layer, meaning there's things that we need to do to make sure that our infrastructure is fully secure, but also how can we build services and solutions so that you can also know that as you're building applications, you can also protect the security at the application level using the code that you write and the, the infrastructure that you configure as well. 
one of the unique things that we have with Azure, something we call our Azure Security Center, which basically gives you a way that, that you can get kind of a dashboard view to understand are the solutions that you're building in the cloud really secure. Uh, and we'll basically tell you as part of this, you know, are, are you meeting, following all the best practices that we recommend? And we'll actually alert you when you're not. And we can also tell you when you're actually under attack and when we detect that someone is trying to break into your solution at the application layer, potentially because of a, a hole you have inside the application or a best practice you haven't followed. And the nice thing is this works not just across our services, but really across the entire industry set of security capabilities um, that you can leverage. What I thought I'd do is let's go ahead and show a quick demo of that in action. So we'll switch to machine B if we can backstage. We'll show a quick little demo. So this is um, first time you're gonna see today the Azure Management Console, which basically gives you kind of a unified view of all the different resources uh, that run in an Azure subscription that you can manage uh, as either a developer or as an IT professional. And you know, we'll come back to this and you'll see it a lot more in terms of the services that are being built. And you can see we kind of have a nice dashboard view that you can look at to see the health of your systems. One of the things that we also have that's built in now into the product is uh, this thing we call the Azure Security Center. So it's there by default in the left-hand side of the management console uh, when you log in. And when you click it uh, and open it up, one of the things it does is it basically scans your entire environment. So it's looking at every virtual machine, every application, every database that you basically provision uh, inside Azure. And you know, we'll actually tell you built in what is the current security status of those in that infrastructure and that applications. And so we'll actually tell you, for example, are you not following best practices in certain places? Uh, and we can tell you, for example, you don't have a correct firewall rules set up. Um, we go back to the virtual machine view here. Uh, you can see as an example, we're telling you, you don't have endpoint protection turned on. So we're not doing kind of a, a antivirus. Uh, you don't have disk encryption turned on on several of the virtual machines. Uh, you've updated or patched a system, but 14 of the 108 VMs you forgot to restart after you patched, and so it's not actually in a healthy state yet, um, et cetera. And so the nice thing is this is sort of built-in capabilities that you can leverage. Uh, they're free, they're just part of Azure. Uh, that'll constantly kind of guide you and tell you, are you following these best practices? And again, enable you uh, as you're building your solutions to know that, that you're doing everything you can to lock down your system and make it secure. The other thing that we then basically have built in is something we call security alerts where not only do we look to see are you following best practices, but we'll actually proactively tell you anytime we see attacks happening against your infrastructure and warn you when we think a high severity issue's happened and a hacker somehow got into your system. So for example, let's look at this security incident here. Uh, and what this is basically saying is, hey, we think that a hacker basically took advantage of a vulnerability in your application in order to actually get into your system. And you can kind of see what we've done is try to correlate multiple attacks that someone was trying to do against this particular system. And you know, many of these things, they weren't able to get in. They tried to do a SQL injection uh, attack against the web app and try you know, entering malicious SQL strings. But it looks like that was blocked and prevented um, from actually getting in. There was a brute force uh, remote desktop attack where someone was taking passwords on the internet and trying to log into a virtual machine many, many times. Again, that was unsuccessful. Uh, and then you can see basically a little bit later on, they did actually find a password uh, on the internet that you were using somewhere inside the application and they were able to break in. And you can see from this point on, you know, it looks like they accessed a bunch of your user accounts uh, and then there's now some network communication happening with a malicious machine running on the internet. The nice thing is this basically is watching you constantly, warning you again both for best practices and then if you, those best practices weren't followed. In this case here, it wasn't a secure password. It wasn't actually a machine that was put behind a firewall uh, correctly. You know, the system will actually proactively tell you and warn you. Uh, and this is sort of an example when we talk about trust of the types of capabilities that we're looking to build into our cloud that again, give you that confidence that enables you to run these systems anywhere around the world and be able to bet your business as part of them. I should actually also say, this is not my personal subscription here that we're showing all these wonderful, uh, terrible violations. This is a really good subscription I have, which is ideal for demos, because uh, it has so many problems. Um, 
but uh, uh, the, the other demos I'll show throughout the day aren't on machines that are quite as vulnerable as those ones. So let's go back and switch to machine A. So I talked about global, I talked about trust. The other kind of core thing that we focus a lot on with Azure uh, is really around enabling what we call hybrid-based computing. And I think one of the things that we recognize is, you know, for most organizations uh, that aren't startups, or pretty much every organization that isn't a startup, hybrid is kind of a reality that you need to think about as you're building your solutions and as you look to try to take advantage of cloud-based services. And hybrid for us isn't sort of just uh, about infrastructure or isn't just about connecting a network pipe between your existing data center and one of ours. Hybrid is really around how do you think about your entire technology stack that you're building applications on top of and how do you actually uh, leverage um, hybrid-based services at each layer of those stacks, whether it's at the infrastructure layer uh, so you can have common infrastructure management in both places, whether it's at the application platform layer so that you can use, for example, something like .NET or take advantage of our app server technology in multiple places, both your data centers as well as ours as well as other uh, cloud providers about the data platform so you can actually have a common way to store data, query data, and, and analyze data, and again, be able to run that everywhere, uh, all the way up to identity, all the way up to the productivity and the business applications that run on top. And collectively, this gives you lots of options uh, as you build your applications and gives you the flexibility where you can easily integrate with systems you already have and be able to extend them with the public cloud as opposed to having to replace them uh, in order to actually bring up uh, new capability. The other thing that we focused a lot on has been around how do we enable you to do all this and manage it such that uh, as you're deploying this and running it in your own data centers, our data centers, even someone like AWS's data centers, that you can actually have a single management view across the entire spectrum and be able to understand how your systems are performing, how they're actually operating, what the reliability is, and be able to do it with a single common management console um, throughout everything. And we provide that built into both Azure and something we call our operations management uh, and security offering, which again will work not just with Azure, but with any other system out there that you already have. So let's go ahead and switch back to machine B and uh, we'll show off another quick demo of what I mean by that hybrid management in action. So you can see here, so we're going back to this machine, we'll close down the security center. Um, what I thought I'd do is just actually show off a couple of uh, simple scenarios that kind of highlight how you can manage cloud-based infrastructure, but then how you can also integrate it with your existing on-premise footprint uh, that you already are deploying solutions uh, in many cases on. So how many people here have ever sort of managed a server infrastructure remotely? Not a lot of hands, so. How many people are here for dev intersections? Good, okay. So you're not here for the golf tournament. Uh, it would feel awkward uh, if I had the, But, you know, one of the things that I think um, both if you're in, in uh, from an IT operations perspective, but increasingly also from a developer perspective, uh, or often need to think about as you're getting to more agile-based deployment models, is how do you actually know is your system healthy? And when it's not healthy, how do you actually figure out what's wrong, and how do you actually understand that and be able to act upon it? And so one of the things that we try to build in uh, to our management console in our overall management offering with our cloud is the tools that give you that flexibility to do that, whether you're an IT operator or whether you're a developer. Uh, and you can set it up so that developers have read access, you can set it up so developers have read and write access, um, and you can kind of construct regardless of kind of how your organization's uh, organized and uh, how you choose to kind of model um, all those different workflows. And so let me show off a couple examples of that here. So we're going to come back to this dashboard view in a bit, but you can see we've got a lot of uh, top-level metrics here automatically um, provided. And um, in fact, one of the things you can do show that now is you can have multiple dashboards inside Azure. So this might be, if I'm a developer, my sort of default development dashboard, which is just showing kind of a very resource view of what I'm actually developing against. And if someone in IT calls me and says, hey, the application's having a problem, it's performing really slow, I can actually click to any of the monitoring dashboards that I've already pre-configured, and this is gonna now load up for me a quick kind of uh, top sub view that shows me the health of all my systems that I can now use to basically pinpoint and help IT understand what the problem might be in order to take a preventative action. So that, that, that's one nice thing you can do is kind of have that flexibility. 
The other thing that we've just launched is our new monitoring support inside Azure. So we call it our kind of Azure monitor uh, service, which gives you kind of a unified view that anyone, whether it's developer or IT operations, can use to understand what's going on inside the system. And so you can see here, uh, one of the things that we list is everything that's happening with my subscription. And so I can actually see a full audit log of everything um, that's going on throughout this entire infrastructure. Who's changed what? So in this case here, uh, four minutes ago, someone on my team looked at one of the keys of uh, the application that I'm working on. Um, you can see when someone created a VM, stopped a VM. You can even see if, if uh, you know, there was a network glitch, for example, uh, looks like nine minutes ago, somewhere in East Asia, uh, where there was a blip on the network. Um, I can basically see all that in one view and sort of see a common activity log of everything that's going on. The other thing I can then basically do is I can go ahead and uh, very easily look at metrics across all my different resources. So for example, I'm going to basically pull up a virtual machine here that someone might be saying is running a little bit slow. And we now provide the ability where I can go ahead and uh, easily track any metrics I want uh, on this virtual machine. And as I do it, you know, again, I can basically graph out the health of this individual resource and slice or dice it however I want um, in a centralized way. And what's nice is you'll notice on any of these metrics, I can pin it to a dashboard. And so in this case here, if I pin it to my dashboard, and then we go back to this surface view, you can see that's that custom metric view that I just created uh, integrated as part of it. And in fact, if I wanted to change it around, I could easily go ahead and edit this dashboard and if I wanted to, I could resize it to be a different size. I could move it around however I want within this screen. Uh, and then when I'm done, I can finish and publish it to anyone else on my team. So it makes it really easy to basically uh, understand, customize uh, my system, and get a, a view that lets me see everything that's going on across this entire stack uh, and be able to kind of see it in a quick dashboard view what's happening. Now, dashboards are useful because they let you kind of quickly see at, at a macro level what's happening. But the reality is when you're trying to debug issues, you typically want to be able to kind of dive in deep and be able to do custom log searches or be able to do custom analytics and be able to do custom queries to really debug things on a much deeper level. So the other thing that we have that's built in that's nice is the, the ability to look at all this telemetry that's coming from a particular uh, app that's running in our cloud and be able to do custom log searches as part of it. So I'm going to look at a uh, search across some telemetry here uh, that I'm pulling in as part of my subscription. I'm just going to do a star search right now. And what you'll see is when I did this star search, I basically pulled back about 6 million results from my log file. Of course, you can see when I move the cursor so this thing, the help screen doesn't show. But right there, for example, you'll see there's 6 million results that I just pulled back by searching across this log. So 6 million individual log entries. If I wanted to, I can even break it down. So let's do another custom search. And this is going to basically just list across those 6 million different entries the 42 unique types of log records that I'm actually collecting within the system. And you can see I've got database ones. I've even got systems like VMware and Windows Firewall logs and other systems, there's the VMware ones, um, within the system. And so this actually can not just pull the log entries from the cloud, but in the case of VMware, it's going back to my on-premises infrastructure, collecting up all those logs and integrating it as part of this view. So I can now see, in a hybrid way, really the management of my entire estate, whether it's running in my data center on Hyper-V or VMware or OpenStack, whether it's running inside Azure, or even whether it's running on a different cloud provider like AWS. And then if I want to, I can go super granular. So this is an example of a query that's going to pull my databases and basically uh, across my Azure, uh, any of the Azure subscriptions that start with advisor, and then it's star, so it's, it's basically wildcarded. And it's going to measure the max average, uh, CPU uh, with an interval of 20 minutes. And what this means now is when I plug this in, hit enter, and you can see this is going against those 6 million logs. It basically just created this graph for me that's showing me 648 unique different databases that I have, what their average CPU was on a 20-minute granularity. I can even zoom in on top of any of those to be able to get a crisper view. 
And if I want, I can go ahead and create a table view and actually see the raw individual records. Um, so I have lots of interesting database names. Um, <laughs> and again, what the aggregated value was across that time sample. Again, the beauty is I could do this all in the browser across every piece of infrastructure that my entire company runs. And I can use this now to very quickly identify what was the problem in the application and how do I actually go ahead and fix it if it's a bug within my app. So that's sort of an example, if you will, of some of the kind of hybrid management capabilities that are all built in. And the beauty here is I don't need to buy any hardware to enable this. I basically can just log in, click that monitor tab, and I have all this at my fingertips. So let's switch back now and go back to the demo machine, machine A. <coughs> the last thing I'll just mention around hybrid is you can do this, uh, all these scenarios I'm showing using our data centers in the public cloud with Azure, but we also enable you to take what we call our Azure Stack software and run it on your existing servers inside your data center as well. And so with the Azure Stack, you get a consistent infrastructure as well as platform services layer that you can build any type of application on top of and basically keep it in sync with the public cloud. So even if you're operating in a very heavily regulated environment, you can basically go ahead and uh, take advantage of a cloud-based development model um, for any type of solution. One of the things that's super important with the cloud, and I think with development going forward, is that you have the flexibility to use the right tool for the right job. And that tool might be different depending on the type of job you're doing and the type of application that you're building. And so one of the things that we focused a lot on with Azure and with our overall cloud platform is giving you that flexibility where, again, you can use whatever technology you want as you're building your solution. You can build window, use Windows Server or you could use Linux. I'm going to show demos today. Some of them are in .NET, some of them are Node.js. Um, you can use any database, you can target any type of device, and you again have that flexibility to be able to build any type of solution. And the thing we're seeing is where we've kind of built out this infrastructure is amazing companies all over the world are taking advantage of it. Uh, we have about 90% of the Fortune 500 companies are now using the Microsoft Cloud, and all these logos specifically are taking advantage of Azure today. Uh, and there's some pretty amazing solutions um, that they're building. And from a usage perspective, we're seeing kind of our momentum continue to grow. Uh, where we're getting 120,000 new Azure customer subscriptions every single month. Uh, more than 1.6 million databases hosted in production now using the public cloud uh, inside Azure. More than 2 trillion IoT messages every single week. Millions of organizations that are syncing their Azure Active Directory and, and enabling single sign-on and rich identity management. And more than 4 million developers that are taking advantage of all this. Of the, all this. And what I'm going to do the rest of the talk now is dive into the code and dive into the details. And actually, we're going to walk you through building, again, both mobile and cloud-based applications and kind of give you a hands-on view in terms of how you can take advantage of this to really build fantastic solutions. So with Azure today, we provide a rich set of capabilities. So I've showed off some of the infrastructure capabilities already. We're going to spend the rest of the day talking about some of these higher-level capabilities, what we call advanced workloads that you can leverage as well. And these are basically managed services that we provide that enable you as a developer to focus more on the development of your app as opposed to having to work about, worry as much about configuring and managing the infrastructure it depends on. So we've got services for doing mobile development and for web development. We've got database as a service where you can basically stand up and provision both relational and NoSQL databases to solve uh, hard problems. And we have rich container management so you can take advantage of the latest things like Docker as well as microservice-based architectures. And I'm going to give you kind of a brief view with a whole bunch of demos of each of those uh, throughout today's talk. And you can use any tool uh, to build these types of applications. The tool I'm going to use today primarily, because um, I'm, I'm biased in the tool set I like, is our Visual Studio family. Or you can now take advantage of Visual Studio, the IDE, which probably a lot of people in this room take advantage of and use. You can use our new Visual Studio Code tool, uh, which is free. It's open source. It works not just on Windows, but also on Mac and Linux systems and can support any programming language. And you can take advantage of our Visual Studio Team Services offering, which provides a whole bunch of back-end services, things like build, continuous integration, continuous uh, deployment uh, capabilities in order to actually uh, provide the, the things necessary for you to run in a team environment and enable a great DevOps model. One of the uh, great um, capabilities we've added to this overall family 
and we're integrating deeply inside Azure, is a company we call Xamarin. Um, how many people here use Xamarin today? How many people here have heard of Xamarin? Great. So we're going to show some demos and we got uh, some cool stuff coming up here. So Xamarin provides a rich way that you can do mobile application development and build truly native mobile apps. Uh, so these have full advantage, take advantage of the full API set that's in iOS or Android uh, or Windows-based devices and enable, give you the performance and the UI look and feel of a fully native application. And it's something that uh, hopefully you'll see when you see the demos, something that developers love because it enables you to be immediately productive and target all these different types of um, devices and build fantastic apps. And it's one that's trusted and used by enterprises all over the world. What I want to do is just show a quick video of a couple of customers of Xamarin today talking about the solution, and then we'll dive in and show some great code demos. Here's a video. Xamarin allows our team to get to market faster than our competition. Xamarin is a platform that works for native development on iOS, Android, and Windows. It allows us to not need to focus on all the different development tools, but allow us to write a better code and provide better features. Xamarin Test Cloud allows us to push our app to over 2,000 real devices, both mobile phones and tablets, across a matrix of operating systems and device types so that we can get the kind of coverage we would never be able to support in-house. Pinterest is a very visual tool to be testing, so Xamarin makes sense in terms of its live devices testing the, the physical app just like a user would use it. Working with Xamarin Test Cloud is giving us the confidence to get to our next 100 million users. With 2.3 million daily active users, there are a lot of people that rely on Slack. Finding issues and bugs and being able to report that really shows the value of the automation that we're building. The Xamarin Test Cloud had a, the ability to run our automation against a huge, huge device library that they offered, as well as the reporting back that Xamarin gives us after the tests are complete is very detailed, allows us to look at different types of app usage data, battery usage data, and then of course looking at the actual stack traces of failures and logs was extremely important as well. We have a great collaboration with LEGO, which is trying to enable students to find that love of engineering through robotics. The combination of Visual Studio, .NET, and Xamarin provide that very scalable bridge from desktop to mobile. If I can write one piece of code and it works everywhere, that makes me very happy. Xamarin is sick. It's crazy the kind of stuff you can do with this product. As, you know, one of the great things that you can do with Xamarin is build fully native mobile apps uh, using C Sharp. And again, you can use, take advantage of the full mobile platform API capabilities of any of the device that you target, and you can have a common code base that you can then have shared library code that you can use across all these different platforms and all these different types of devices. What I want to do is uh, invite James on stage uh, to show off a demo of how you can basically build these types of native mobile apps and the productivity that the combination of Visual Studio and Xamarin gives you uh, to do that. So here's James. Hey, how's everyone doing? Thank you, Scott, so much. I'm super excited to be here. I'm going to log back into my Mac because there's no Mac OS hello. So let's do that. Good old IT policy. My favorite part about joining uh, Microsoft <laughs> is your machine goes to sleep every five seconds. Perfect. All right, cool. So I'm super excited to be here. How many of you are C-sharp developers? Perfect. Right choice. How about F-sharp? Like one, two, right choice two. VB.net, we love them all. All right, so I'm going to show you today in the five minutes that Scott gave me to show off and build a great, beautiful native application with Xamarin. I'm going to build uh, a quick application here for iOS. So let's jump over to machine C. Perfect. So a lot of people ask me, they say, James, where do I get started? Well, you get started right inside of Visual Studio. Uh, when I go to File, New Project here, what we're going to see is I have Xamarin installed. So I have Android, cross-platform, iOS. I have uh, tvOS, so watch applications. It's great. Under cross-platform, we're going to see some blank applications. We have two ways to build apps, building up purely native user interfaces with shared code, or Xamarin Forms, I have a, which is a cross-platform UI. I'm going to build out a really quick application in the five minutes that I have here. And essentially, what we're going to do is build a mapping application. Maybe you're building the next Yelp, or Pokemon Go, or geocaching. And you want to go out there, and you want to map some stuff on a map. So let's see if I can do that in five minutes. So I've created a blank application with a portable class library. 
And when you take a look at the structure, there's an Android application, an iOS application, and down here, a shared code library. That's where I write all my business logic, models, view models, Azure integration, just .NET C Sharp code. Here for my iOS application, I have properties, like NuGet packages, like JSON.NET, my shared code project, a bunch of system.NET goodness, and then Xamarin and iOS. And that's every single API inside of iOS. And we have the same exact API. Every single thing that you could do in Objective-C, Swift, or Java, you can do it in C Sharp. So I want to get started. I want to build this application. So I'm going to go ahead and double tap on the main storyboard file. And this main storyboard file is like an overview for my application. And I'm on this kind of like weird setup, so we're going to zoom out a little bit. And this is a blank page. It's beautiful. You see a lot of hard work has gone into that. Now, it's kind of like this drag and drop user interface. So over here, I have my toolbox with every single iOS control inside of it. Uh, I have a property grid that I can add attributes to. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select, I'm going to design for the iPhone 5 here. And let's just put down a few things. I'm going to slap down a label. So just go ahead and drag and drop it down. This is our full iOS designer. So you have access to everything there. So we can make this bigger. There we go. Uh, here I'm going to put down a button, because everyone loves buttons. There's a button. Boom. And we have full support for auto layout, auto you know, layouts, everything like that. So everything that you could do inside the, the Xcode interface builder stuff. So what I want to do is throw it on a map. So I type in map, and this is a native map view. So here we go. This is beautiful. I'll make it bigger. Awesome. Now, I want to just modify a few properties. So you'd expect to do that just in the, the user interface. So there's property grid on the bottom left. I'll call this the My Map. Over here in the button, we'll call this My Button, which is a great name for a button. And let's just say, instead of button, we'll say Add Pin. And we can see the user interface updates right away. And then this will be My Label. Perfect. Most beautiful user interface I've ever created. I'm sure Apple will approve. They won't. <laughs> so this is a view controller, and there's some code behind for it. So inside of here, essentially think of it as just a code behind for your view. So when I tap on the view controller, here my toolbox goes away, and I just have some C sharp code. Inside of here is a UI view controller, and there's view did low, there's did receive memory warning. I can come up here and say, hey, I want to use you know, system.link. Sure, we'll give you link. Let's use some other things, like some core uh, location, and maybe using MapKit. So I'm using the core iOS actual APIs that are there. And we've c sharpified everything. So here's what I want to do. Anytime I move that map around, let's update that label. So I'm going to come in over here. I'm going to say My Map. And since I named it, it automatically created the outlet for me, the name and the code behind. So I can say Region Changed, which is just an event, plus equals. Uh, we'll just do some uh, little lambda here, sender args. There we go. Perfect. Now I can actually just get access to that. So I'm just going to make this a little bit bigger. There we go. And we'll say, let me grab the center point. And the center point will be, of course, my map. And we've strong typed everything inside of here. So there's the region and the center property. Right? Just some C-sharp code. And then I'll say my label dot text. Again, nice, nice strong typing. And then we'll use some C-sharp 6 features, so some string interpolation. I'll say center.latitude. And then I'll say center dot dot longitude. Perfect. But also what I want to do is maybe add some pins to this map, because it's cool to update a label. But what if I could actually say where I'm at right now on that map, do a reverse geolocation lookup to find the address, and then put a pin on the map? And I'm going to do that in about four lines of code, all with C-sharp features. So I'm going to say my button here. I'm going to add a click event, which is a touch up inside event. I'm going to say plus equals. Then we're going to asyncify this puppy. So we'll add async sender args. Again, just a little lambda. Boom. Now what I can do is I can come in and say, hey, let's grab that center point one more time. Bup, bup, bup. There we go. Now what I want to do is I'm going to create something called a coder, a geocoder. And that's going to be a new CL geocoder. And this is a core location API. That's going to allow me to do that reverse geolocation lookup. And you can see Visual Studio is like, hey, you haven't used any async stuff at all. I'm like, OK, I will, I will. So let me grab some points. And what I'll do is I'll say await. And then I'll say coder dot. I want to make this, I'm going to zoom in here. This is, super, this is super cool and super awesome. So when I say coder, that's the core location APIs. And when I type reverse, you can see reverse geocode location. 
and then reverse geocode location async. The async, that's not, that doesn't exist in, in Swift and Objective-C. We C sharpified and we improved the core iOS APIs. So when I want to send it the core location and, and get this reverse geolocation lookup, I'll just pass that a new uh, core CL, see what it wants, CL location. And we're going to pass it a latitude and longitude. So center.latitude and center.longitude. Perfect. I'll zoom back out so we can do some coding. Now I'm going to have my points that are coming in here. So what I can do now is I can say, you know, let me grab the first one, and I'll say points dot first, right, just using some link, if that may be first or default, just to be sure. And I'll say if the first equals null, I'll just return, right, get out of there. Now we want to place a pin on the map. That's the final step, the last line of code. So I'll say my map dot add annotation. I'm going to add a new MK point annotation. These are the core APIs in iOS. Now, I haven't written any shared code yet, but you, you know, we'll take a look at that in a second after I deploy this. So here's what I want to do is add this annotation. Again, strong type, so the coordinate is going to be the center. We don't want to put a title on it, and that is going to be the first dot name. And we'll just say, hey, if that's null at all, we'll just say unknown. There we go. Now my iOS application is ready to go inside of here. I can go ahead and recompile it. And all of that code is being compiled right here inside of Visual Studio. Uh, and I don't have anything else to do. It's like if I want to go back, modify the user interface, I can. Now, once this compiles up, what we're going to see is that I want to deploy it onto a simulator or a device. Now, uh, Apple doesn't ship their you know, SDKs or simulators or anything like that on the PC, so I have this beautiful rose gold Mac. I always like to pull out rose gold because I picked it out myself. It's a very beautiful color, and it's just sitting here looking pretty. And what my actual Visual Studio is doing here is it's going out and it's communicating with my Mac to do a remote uh, debug session onto a simulator. So here I'm just going to say, hey, let me just launch this on the iPhone 5S. It goes into debug mode. And then down right over here, I have a full iOS simulator. It's our remote iOS simulator for Visual Studio. It's the world's first. It gives you full fidelity to do anything that you could do on a Mac and more right from Visual Studio. Uh, and we see we have some, we have some really bad, uh, some, some bad, bad issues going on here with my, my, my drag and dropping, and that's okay. We could fix that up if I had more time. But we'll just assume here that I'm going to zoom in, and we can see this thing update. And as I go ahead and put down some pins here, I can go ahead and, and move around. And we hit breakpoints, right? We're debugging an iOS application. We can go ahead and debug anything. And then here what I can do is I can just go ahead and attempt to find Las Vegas on this tiny map because I didn't add any constraints. Bad me. And then I can just say add pin. And then boom, I get a pin. So you the reverse geolocation, look up automatically, and there it is. Now, we can see I have some issues here. And if I had more time, what I could do is I could come back in here, click on this, and then add correct actual guidelines. So here you can see we're having all those issues because I was a bad developer and tried to do some shortcuts and didn't pin my map to and from the different locations. We have full support for all of this right there. And now I can go back and forth. And I have this all set up, and then I could redeploy. So as I'm moving around my map, redeploying, it makes it really quick to iterate not only on my user interface, but also on my code. And then any of my shared logic, so those Azure integrations, all that stuff like that, will be coming down um, from my actual shared code that I could add right into my Android application. Boom, there's a beautiful map, much better in the 30 seconds. Just like that, five, six minutes, full native, beautiful application inside of Visual Studio. All right, thanks. We go back to uh, machine A. You know, the cool thing is everything that James showed you there, as you saw in five or six minutes, you can build these native applications, uh, not just for iOS, but also for Android and for Windows. And the overall approach of Xamarin enables you to take full advantage of all of the native APIs on those platforms. But at the same time, you can create a shared library, just the same st uh, standard C -sharp shared library and be able to share logic across all of them as well. So it gives you that great ability to build native apps and also the ability to reuse code as you want to be able to target multiple devices. And what's great is Xamarin is now part of Visual Studio, all editions of Visual Studio, even the free community edition. And so you can basically take advantage of this now without having to pay any extra money and be able to build fantastic mobile experiences that run everywhere. But wait, there's more. Uh, not only do you, does Xamarin give you that ability to build these native mobile apps, but it also 
t handles a lot of the complete kind of overall lifecycle management that you need to think about as you build mobile-based applications. And what do I mean by that? Well, for example, it has specifically has support for something we call the Xamarin Test Cloud, which provides a fantastic way that you can actually automate the testing of these mobile apps across all these different devices. Uh, and so if you want to be able to test your app and make sure it works not just on the latest iPhone, but the, the iPhone 5, not just an Android device, but the thousands of different Android devices out there, the Test Cloud provides an amazing way that you can do that. And what's nice is it integrates also as part of kind of a broader set of solutions that we're providing with our Visual Studio team services, which gives you the flexibility where you can not only uh, do development uh, locally, but you can actually do code hosting, you can do build in the cloud of your mobile apps, you can run tests in the cloud with your mobile apps, and you can even with our hockey app technology be able to do crash analytics and real user profiling and analytics uh, across any of the systems you build before you push it out to all your customers. What we're going to do is pass it over back to James to show off some cool demos of how you can do all this in action. Perfect. So let's head back over to C really quick. Now I had the pleasure to work on this application. It's called My Driving. It essentially turns your car into a smart car. Uh, I can't afford a Tesla, not yet. Maybe Scott will hook that up. Um, but you know, until I do, uh, I wanted to be able to take any car that I have, slap a sensor into it, and enable really this rich IoT that we have. So I helped build this my driving application for iOS, Android, and Windows 10. But essentially, when we went out to build this application, we said, how many things in Azure can we use? And we used like 1%. Um, which is these services here. And we wanted to turn our, our, our phone, which is already tracking our geolocation, stream over Bluetooth or Wi-Fi from these OBD sensors, stream that up to the cloud, do streaming analytics, do machine learning, use Azure um, functions to actually look VIN lookups, all this cool stuff, and feed it through the entire mobile DevOps lifecycle. So every time I push code, it would automatically build, send my apps up to the test cloud, and then um, and then send it out to all my testers, whether they're internal or external. So let me show you that application really quick. So here it is. I just launched it on iOS and Android. And this is a real physical Android device here. And I'm just screen mirroring it. And here we're just simulating a drive. So here I can actually go ahead and start. And at this point, it would try to connect to the actual OBD sensor. I don't have a car sitting around. Scott wouldn't let me bring it on stage. Uh, so I had to just simulate one here. So here it's beautiful, it's going around, and you can see my Android device is just sitting here at the MGM Grand, and I could pinch to zoom in, and I could do some things. And what's really cool is that all this thing, that, that trip that I just took, is automatically synchronized back and forth with Azure. So here, just 11 seconds ago, it did a full round trip. All the data points, all the machine learning that's kind of going on in it has come in. I'm getting the Apple Maps, the Google Maps. We built out these APIs. Then, as I'm doing good or bad, essentially that machine learning will pull in our profile. So here we can see that I've drove quite a few miles. I'm a pretty terrible driver. That's in fact why I don't own a car and I let Zipcar insure me, which is pretty great. It's a pretty great service. <laughs> um, and you can see actually the total trips and we're getting this beautiful iOS and Android API and, and Windows uh, as well. So the cool part is about how we built this. So when I actually go into this application, I was able to show something really quick, but this would be a full iOS storyboard designer, like everything in there. We even threw a little Scott Goo in there. Um, and we can see how well he's driving, 90, 86%. It's OK. Uh, and, and this is a full storyboard. This is how you would design it. We have the same Android designer, too. But what I want to show off is that there's a lot of shared code, right? You could just write an iOS application, just an Android application, or you can write them all. There's all of our OBD sensor, actual streaming over I, uh, Bluetooth and Wi-Fi, our portable class library with all of our models, view models, every single thing inside of it, 80% shared code, and sharing code with our ASP.NET backend. But what I love to show is jumping over here. This application's open source. When you go to azure.com slash mydriving, it'll bring you to the page that I just showed you. You can get all the source code, all of our backend. So here, we have the application in Visual Studio Team Services. One-stop shop. You could be using TFS on-prem or in the cloud, or you could be using GitHub. We're using GitHub for this, so every time we commit code, it kicks off a new build. We can see some builds that were occurring here. We can see our test cloud um, 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 results, our hockey app um, distribution, uh, links directly to the GitHub, our build usage, we build a lot, and our team members. Now what that looks like, it's super simple. You say file new um, inside of Visual Studio Team Services, pick an Android application, and you start, hey, I want to update my version numbers, I download my Keystar, I build my Android application, run my tests, ship it to Test Cloud. 
I've gone ahead with every single commit continuous integration every single time it's built. This test called stuff's really cool. Scott talked about it. That enables you to test any application written in any language. This is a Xamarin app, but it could be any application. It could be Cordova. It could be whatever. It doesn't matter. Inside of Visual Studio Team Services, you can build it, ship it to the test cloud to do automated UI scripts, kind of based on end unit. So here's my dashboard, all of our builds, my app size, my peak memory usage. When I tap on one of those, it comes into here. It shows me my tests. It shows me my failures. I can tap on this, and these are real physical devices, over 2,400 unique devices. I can just go up and watch my application running in real time as I go down. I can tap on one. I can see actual full size memory usage, CPU usage, get full playback of my application running. You can download a full video and you can see your application running in real time, which is really cool uh, along the way. So you can help debug it. Not only for Android, but also for iOS too. So these are the same tests coming in for iOS. I don't have to do anything different. I pick the devices I want to support all the way back to iOS 6, all the way to iOS 10. And we scale these out lar both ways. You know, we have tons of iPhone 6s with all different versions of iOS, same on Android. Then the cool part here is that last step is release management. And here inside a hockey app, I have all my applications being downloaded. And I have not only a way to distribute my applications for free, but also I can go in and see how many downloads, users, session data, crash reporting, see how my application is doing. I can flow this all back into App Insights and see it right in the Azure portal everything going on with this nice query language. So from end to end, I'm going to be showing this later today. It's my first session. I have three sessions here at Dev Intersection. Everything come. There's a lot today. Just a full room of James, and it's going to be great. So full end to end, everything that you can do with Xamarin, Test Cloud, and Visual Studio Team Services. Thank you so great. much. Thanks, James. So we go back to machine A. Um, you know, James showed you kind of how you can build great mobile apps and really focused on how to use Visual Studio to build that mobile experience and then use Visual Studio Team Services on the back end to enable that DevOps workflow for your mobile-based native apps. What I'm going to do now is switch gears and talk more about the back end side and walk through how you can take advantage of Azure to be able to provide all the back end and data logic that's needed to power those types of mobile or web or any other type of application that you want. So I talked about how with Azure we have a rich set of services that you can leverage. Uh, both just the infrastructure, but these higher level services. And one of the powerful ones you can take advantage of is something we call our Azure App Service. It's probably the easiest way to build and scale great cloud-based apps that, again, can target any browser, can target any device. And what's nice about it is you can use any language. So I'm going to show demos for both .NET, I'm going to show Node.js, but I could have shown Java, I could have shown PHP, Python, and more. Uh, the Azure App Service provides a great way you can not only host your code, but it will do automatic patching. So it will update your VMs for you um, automatically. It can scale it out, uh, the number of uh, resources that are actually backing your application based on the actual usage that you're actually seeing. Uh, and it enables you to easily integrate across a wide variety of systems. So the way it works, you can again use any language you want. Uh, to be able to build these sort of back-end solutions. You can push using just FTP, if that's uh, your, your common way you want to push your, your web back-end. But you can also integrate and push with Git or TFS or other source control systems and enable a really nice continuous uh, integration, continuous CI, CD workflow uh, across your environment. Once your app is deployed, auto-scale is built in for you. What this means is when you get a lot of traffic to your application, Azure can automatically scale up more instances of your app to be able to handle that load and that usage. If you get a huge surge of traffic, we can scale up as many VMs as you basically want us to to be able to handle all that load so your users get a really fast experience. And then what's nice about our auto-scale technology is when you don't need that traffic or don't need that, those resources, we can automatically turn off these resources to save you money. So it gives you the best of both worlds, both experience and then cost savings. And you can basically easily use App Service to connect to any existing on-premise resource or database that you already have using our virtual private networking technology. And we also have built into App Service the ability to easily integrate with other SaaS-based applications out there on the internet that you want to be able to connect to as well. And the end result is a really great way that you can build, again, applications using any language to target any mobile device or any web-based experience. So let's go ahead and switch to machine B. And let's show off a couple of demos of this in action. 
So this is another dashboard I have inside Azure. And basically what I can do to create an app service, it's pretty easy. I just click the new button inside Azure. I click web and mobile. And then there's this web app option here that I can select, which will create for me a resource that I can then deploy my applications into. One thing I'll kind of point out that's kind of cool is not only do we have web apps now, but we also have a new what we call web app on Linux option uh, that's in preview. And eventually, once it's out of preview, it'll just be a single web app option. And you can toggle between whether or not you want the underlying VMs that you're deploying on to be running either Windows-based VMs or Linux-based VMs. So you can take full advantage of the native libraries on both as part of your overall application experience. But the development experience and all the other capabilities I'll show today works uh, seamlessly, whether, regardless of whether it's running in an underlying Windows or Linux-based VM, which is pretty nice. So I've got an existing um, app here called LasVegas.net web app that I've uh, created last night, which is basically just an empty app that currently is not being used. Um, what I'm going to do then is just go inside Visual Studio and create and deploy simple ASP.NET MVC application into it. So I got a, just created a default ASP.NET MVC app, so I just a new project, MVC. What do you want to have the about page for this app say? User in the front row, what do you want it to say? Any string you want. Hello world. Hello world, okay. <laughs> I've never heard that before. Uh, so what we're going to do here is I'm just going to show off how you can easily push an application directly inside the IDE. And so what I'm just going to do is hit Publish, uh, right-click Publish in the solution. I can go ahead and inside Visual Studio, basically look in my Azure environment, and you can see that LasVegas.net app uh, that I created last night is there as a deployment option. It automatically pull down the settings for deployment, and I just hit Publish. And this is now going ahead and going to push this application. This is the point where we discover how many of you are tweeting and using the Wi-Fi uh, and filling it up. So I'm pushing now all these binaries up into Azure. Uh, it looks like a lot of bandwidth is being used um, by folks in the audience. So this might take a few more seconds. OK, we've pushed up. There we go. My app is now deployed. And what we should see in about five, four, three, two. One, 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 any second now. It's usually five seconds, except when I'm doing keynotes. Uh, what I will see is this application come back, assuming the network is not flaking out on me, which sometimes it does. But hopefully here will not. Come back, come back. Did I just lose network? There we go. OK, good. Took a few extra seconds there. But you can see now, hello world, just to prove it's real, is deployed. It's now running in Azure, up in a data center, uh, fully deployed from scratch from the IDE. You saw it took less than 60 seconds for us to basically do that. Um, now what's cool is if I go back into Azure now, I can manage this app in a couple of different ways. So I can, I can take advantage of things like auto scale. So if I wanted to, for example, scale this thing out, I could just go and pull up the settings for this app. And you'll notice there's a scale out option here. And right now, this is running in just one what we call worker instance, or effectively think of it like a virtual machine um, that, again, Azure manages for me, so I'm not having to patch the virtual machine. Uh, if I wanted to, I could run this on, let's say, four VMs. And all I need to do is just hit that slider, hit Save, and Azure will dynamically scale out this app now to run in a load balance configuration across multiple VMs. Now, the downside with those, though, is this app right now is not very popular. And so if I scale this out to run on four VMs, eh, it's actually not going to be very cost effective for me because I'm paying for four resources, which I might not need. So one of the other things that we allow you to do is instead have an option here where you can, instead of manually scaling it out, you can scale it out by CPU percentage. And so here I'm going to say I'm going to run it between one and five VMs, or let's just say one and four VMs. And I can target a CPU range. So I can basically say, I want to run these VMs so that the VMs that are running are running between 22 and 73% CPU. What this means is, if I've got a VM that's running at 16%, I'm only going to have one VM total running. Once it goes above, let's say, 73%, I get to 80% usage on that VM, Azure will just automatically create a second instance of my app and scale it up uh, automatically for me. Uh, and then again, if it keeps, the load keeps increasing, it'll keep going until it runs in that 22 to 73% range. And again, I can choose whatever range I want. 
uh, based on my business needs. And the beauty is when my traffic dries off and I go below 27%, we'll start turning off VMs to save you money uh, until we get back into that overall window. And all I need to do is hit save. And this is basically updating my um, uh, Azure configuration. And in about, there we go, 10 seconds, it's now auto-scaled. And I now have an auto-scale rule set up that'll basically be able to handle any of that type of traffic load. Uh, other things that we can do you know, here is I could, if I wanted to connect back from a networking perspective and connect back to my enterprise, if I wanted to connect to, say, an existing SAP system or existing database that I want to connect to. So we have built-in networking support built in here that enables you to have private networking automatically across this infrastructure. Um, the other thing I'll kind of uh, show off here is how many people have ever deployed an app into production and then discovered they had a bug after they did it? Good. It's good that there's so many people here that are so skilled that they've never had that experience. Um, I haven't either, so, but, but, but we, won't, we won't pick on the people that raise their hand. Um, one of the things that, uh, you know, that's hard is sometimes figuring out, you know, how do you test an app in production to know whether you have an issue or not? And so one of the nice things that's also built into this um, service is this notion of what we call deployment slots. And so with a deployment slot, you can actually create any number of instances of the application that you can send traffic to in a private way. Well, what do I mean by that? So for example, I could have here my Las Vegas.net app, and you'll notice I have a staging slot that I've created. And if I wanted to, I could create a test slot, I could create a uh, internal only slot, whatever slot I want to, I can basically create it. It's going to use the same infrastructure that I'm publishing to the outside world um, to basically run my application, but it's going to have a unique URL that I don't have to publish to the world that I can use to basically test my application. And so, for example, if I go inside Visual Studio here, let's go ahead and say, instead of hello world, let's say hello world staging version. Like so. I could then republish my application, and instead of publishing it to the main version that the whole world's going to see, I'm going to instead publish it to the staging slot. And so I'm going to go in here, my Las Vegas demo apps, I can select here, you'll notice I have, uh, when I expand this, I should see in just a second, staging as an option. So I'm going to say, let's deploy this app now to staging. It's pulling down the, the configuration information here. I'm now going to publish to my staging version. And so it's going to repeat that, that publishing process. But now instead of overwriting the application that all of you would hit if you hit that URL directly right now, it's instead publishing this into this private staging location, which is running on that infrastructure, but which has a different URL. In this case here, you'll notice lasvegas.net dash staging. And you can customize the URL however you want. You can even lock it down so that other people can't hit the URL until you've actually validated that your app is running and that you're perfectly happy and fine with it. And what I should see again here, once it's finished publishing in a few more seconds, is when I click the About box here, I now have a staging version that's running using the staging URL. And if I go back and hit Refresh on my main production URL, you'll notice it still has the previous version. So I now have two versions running inside that, app, inside that instance running in the cloud. And then what's nice is anytime I want to change it, I can swap any of these different locations. So I'm going to basically now swap my production slot and my staging slot. And now I'm automatically reversing these two slot locations so that what was in my staging is now going to be in production. And what was previously in my production is now going back into my staging slot. So that if I need to, I can swap back very quickly if I discover that I have a bug or I have an issue. And so this basically kicked off uh, this overall uh, deployment. What we should see here then uh, relatively soon, yep. I just hit refresh. Notice now the staging text is in production. Uh, and so that new version is now live. And then if I go back to my staging slot and hit refresh, you'll notice that text disappears because my old version is now saved, still deployed, but basically saved without people getting traffic. This means now if I discover a bug, I can immediately swap back to the previous version without having to redeploy anything, without having to reconfigure anything. I just basically issue a swap command, and in 10 seconds, I'm back. If I want to be even fancier, I could actually, when I deploy a new version of my code, I even set it so that, say, 1% of the traffic goes to the new version, 99% of my users go to the old version, and I can actually use real-world traffic to simulate and basically detect whether or not my new version of the, of the code is actually working in a healthy state or not. Again, all those kinds of capabilities are built in, 
and cool things that I can leverage and take advantage of. Let's go ahead and show off another uh, version of app service. How many people here are using Node.js? Okay, a number of people are. Um, what's cool is you can basically build web apps uh, and mobile apps using Azure and using the app service capability using any technology. So I showed .NET here, but let's go ahead and show off some Node.js. And so I have another version here called Las Vegas Node uh, that I basically um, created an instance of an app service uh, last night. And you'll notice here if I go into my deployment options, uh, one of the things I can do on an app service is basically configure it uh, so that I can deploy things in a variety of different ways. And so I can basically uh, set this up so that I can do what's called continuous software uh, integration or de uh, delivery uh, of my um, code. And so I basically have set this up so I'm using Git to basically do publishing of source code into production. Uh, and so I can basically just copy this git clone URL, and in this case here, I've got a simple bash shell here that has git running, and so I've got a sample app. Uh, this app here I'm doing, using is uh, the Scotch Mean app, which is a Mongo Node.js-based application that you can download from GitHub uh, that lets you do kind of a simple mapping uh, scenario. Here I'm loading it inside Visual Studio Code, but I could use Vim, I could use Sublime, I could use any text editor I want. Uh, and I can basically make any code changes I want as part of this. So I'm just going to go into here and what, what string do you want me to modify this code to prove it's real? Silence in Vegas. Uh, there we go. So I'm going to make a simple change to this Node.js app. I'm going to go back here. I'm going to basically check in the code. I'm going to commit it. Say updated string. I'm going to say git push Azure master. And I'm basically now pushing the source code, in this case here with Node.js, up into the cloud. And so this is now basically just doing a standard git push. What's nice about app service, though, is when I'm pushing the git version, it'll also now automatically can run deployment scripts for me um, and is basically provisioning it across those app server instances. It can take advantage of the staging slots. It can take advantage of the auto scale. It can take advantage of the private networking support. It's now deployed, and if I go back here and I now click the URL for this Las Vegas Node app, uh, what we should see uh, is this app with the code change I just made deployed live, running in production. Um, and that's how easy it is, you know, again, not just from Visual Studio, but from just the command line using Git, or I could use FTP, and I can use any programming language in order to build this app and run it. This app's kind of cool in that it is, uh, again, it's just the standard app that you can clone off of GitHub. And it basically is sort of a simple mapping app. So you can pick a location, and then you can go ahead and say, Scott was here. Uh, I can say, mail, I'm not 72. Um, favorite language, C sharp. And I can basically submit it. And what this basically does is it just adds a little pin here uh, on the map that stores all that information. It's a simple app that, kind of, again, illustrates Node. and illustrates how to use a NoSQL database, in this case here, uh, MongoDB um, as part of this application. And if you look at the code, um, you can kind of see the, uh, all the, the different MongoDB-based um, APIs that are used. It's just the standard one, and I haven't modified anything. Uh, the one thing I did modify as part of this app uh, was just actually in the, um, I'm not going to remember where I modified it. Uh, there's a URL here in config where I basically just introduced a new uh, connection string that this app is using for something called DocDB. And I thought I'd just show this off real quick. So this application stores its data using a MongoDB database. Um, you can run vanilla MongoDB, say for example, in a virtual machine, or we also have partners that provide MongoDB as a service in Azure. But one of the other things that we now support is uh, a built-in NoSQL service that we call DocDB. Uh, which is just provided as a pl native platform service that you can leverage. And when you create a DocDB database, uh, one of the, thing the cool things that you can do is you can give it any name, and then you can also specify what NoSQL API you want to support. And one of the options we support is MongoDB. And so if you create a uh, DocDB database with MongoDB as the API, you now have a fully managed uh, NoSQL database. You can store, you can basically scale to hundreds of terabytes of data within it. Uh, you get a full management experience as part of it. 
Uh, so for example, uh, right within here, I can kind of see the scaling units of it. I can even go ahead and see full analytics like I showed earlier uh, in terms of charts, in terms of how it's actually performing and scaling. And the beauty is my Node app just thinks it's talking to MongoDB. It's using the exact same libraries and APIs. I can even use the MongoDB admin tools against this DocDB database. And I've got a fantastic now mean development stack that I can use on Azure uh, and take full advantage of any language I want. Basically use the libraries I already use. I can deploy it from any machine or tool that I already take advantage of. And I can scale it to run all over the world. And as you saw, it's really easy to do it. And I get a great, rich management experience as I do so. So let's switch back now quickly to the slides. I'm going to show one more set of demos before we break. So that's Azure App Service. And it's probably the easiest way to get started. And again, it's a great way that you can leverage Windows, Linux, any programming language, any tool, build fantastic back-end applications. Another service I just want to show, and, and I'll probably close on here, is Azure Functions, which is another great service uh, that we have. It's currently in preview, but it'll go general availability in about a month. Uh, that you can take advantage of where if, if you want to be able to put code in the cloud and not even have a virtual machine and instead effectively just upload functions that the world can take advantage of, um, it provides a really effective way that you can do it uh, and a really cost-effective way that you can leverage cloud-based infrastructure. Uh, and it takes advantage of a paradigm called serverless-based computing. And it works again with C Sharp, it works with Node.js, and it also works with other languages as well. Uh, and it provides a pretty cool way that you can take advantage of Azure for the first time uh, in a really slick way. So let's go back to the demo of Machine B, and we'll show off a couple of cool examples here. So uh, I can create a Functions app. So again, I just go click the New button, I click New Function, and it would go ahead and create this experience. And it's a really easy, fast way that you can go ahead and build something. So I can, if I wanted to, I could pick different types of um, functions I want to create. In this case here, I could just go ahead and if I wanted to, I'm just going to create a simple HTTP trigger. Um, so this is going to be some code. Let's call it hello world in silence. Uh, I can call it anything I want. Create it. And this basically gives me even a simple code editor that I can use in the browser. I can also check it into source control or use my favorite development tools in order to write it. But if I just want to basically upload a function in the cloud, in this case here, a 20-line C-sharp function that's just going to pull stuff from the query string and respond, I could do that. I can hit Save. And now I can just take this URL, paste it in here in my browser, saying, please pass the name on the query string. We'll call this name equals Scott. And you can see in about 10 seconds, we created a function uploaded some code, I passed in a query string, and it basically said, hello, Scott. What's nice is this is going to cost me like one billionth of a penny uh, in order to run this scenario, because I don't have a virtual machine sitting idle uh, or even running at 20 or 30 percent utilization. I actually, this code will only run when someone basically invokes this function using a HTTP URL, and then we'll dynamically schedule it to run on somewhere in our capacity, execute it, and send back that response. So a really easy, cost-effective way that you can start to integrate functionality within your app. How many people here use GitHub? How many people have heard of something called webhooks? A couple people have. Webhooks are a pretty cool feature. And so basically with webhooks, you can do a couple things. So with a webhook, you can, uh, it's sort of integration glue that you can typically use across applications. So here I'm in GitHub, and I've got a simple Hello World demo. And within GitHub, if you click the Settings tab, uh, you can go ahead and there's a little option here on the left-hand side called webhooks. And you can register with GitHub a URL that it will call when certain events happen in GitHub. And that's, that URL is called a webhook. So I can hit add webhook. And when I do that, oh, it's going to ask me to sign in. Good, it didn't ask me to do multi-factor authentication. Um, that would be a longer demo. Uh, and basically what it's asking is tell me a URL to call and then tell me a secret I can pass in to verify that this is GitHub calling you as opposed to someone random. So let's go ahead and use functions here in Azure to create a new GitHub function. And so I'm going to go ahead here, create a GitHub webhook. I can again do it in C Sharp. I could do it in Node. We're going to create one. And the only code change I'm going to make here is I'm just going to copy this code in. 
And what this webhook is just doing, or this function that we just created is doing, is basically just triggering it. It's pulling out the payload that GitHub is going to send us, and it's just logging and saying GitHub comment and spitting out the value that someone saved. We're going to hit save. I'm going to take this function URL. I'm going to go into GitHub, paste it in. I'm then going to go back, and I'm going to take the secret, which is not very secret anymore since I just shared it with all you, paste it in. And I'm just going to say to GitHub, send me everything when you fire that webhook. And now GitHub is just registering and making sure this webhook is active. Uh, and what it should see, you're going to hit refresh. Assuming the network is working, uh, is I can now use this. And let's scroll down now. And hopefully now, when I go to issues, if I click on this, I'm going to add a comment. What stays, what happens in Vegas? Bum, bum. I'm going to hit post a comment. This just posted to GitHub. GitHub just called that webhook uh, inside my functions app. I come back here, and what I should see, assuming I pasted in that URL correctly, which I'm starting to worry maybe I didn't, is there we go. A GitHub thing just triggered, and it basically just said what happens in Vegas uh, from my function. And so basically, as you saw there, in about 10 seconds, I was able to create a GitHub function. Right now, I'm just basically spitting out the comment that came back, wire it up to GitHub, trigger that webhook whenever an event happens inside GitHub, calls my function, executes, I'm able to spit back that value. And obviously, this is a simple scenario, but you can start to see now how you can take advantage of functions to write something a little bit richer sends a page, sends an email, runs some custom logic, kicks off a workflow. Uh, and you, know, you start to use this functions technology really as glue that you can use to kind of stitch together a wide variety of different other scenarios. The last thing I'll just show on functions, uh, and then we'll wrap, is um, the fact that you can queue functions not just from URLs, but when other things happen within the system. So one of the things that's nice is you can wire up functions inside Azure, so you can trigger them to happen when, uh, when services inside Azure are modified. So for example here, I could set it up so that any time something is stored in my Azure Blob account, which is an object store account that I can store petabytes of information in, I'm going to basically trigger a function to run. And what this function is going to do is basically take the item out of that Blob store, in this case an image. It's going to go ahead and call a vision service API which is built into Azure that does character recognition off of images. And it's going to basically decipher any text inside that image, return it using a link query, and then basically store it inside a NoSQL database. And what this means now is if I go back to my page here, I'm going to go ahead and oh, not do that. I'm going to open this with Microsoft Paint. I'll do some text. What would you like me to say to prove it's real? Dot net rocks. We'll hit save. I'm now going to go ahead and upload this into the cloud. So I could do this obviously in my mobile app, or in this case here, I'm just going to use simple Storage Explorer to copy this thing. Just uploaded that image. What should, when I go back to Azure, this is basically what I should find. Just a second, is it triggered that? Workflow, that function fired. It called the Vision Recognition API on top of the image, parsed out the image stored in that JPEG, returned it as a link query. And you can see .NET Rocks was just output. And if I go now into my NoSQL database, which is configured as the output for this, oops, and that's a different NoSQL database. Go into this one. Um, what I should find when I go to images, I pull up the document explorer, I pull up my images, and I scroll down, and I click the last record that was added. This .NET Rocks has now persisted inside my NoSQL database. Again, I could use DocDB, or I could use the MongoDB APIs against it and build that entire solution. So that's sort of a simple example of using functions, how you can integrate really across a wide variety of different scenarios um, and be able to, uh, you know, build some great apps in the cloud super, super fast. So we just go back to the slides, and I'll go ahead and wrap up. So I've shown here today 
a lot of the capabilities, uh, so go back to machine A, sorry, in the back. Machine A, yep. So I've shown you just a brief set of some of the capabilities that you can do with Azure and how you can go ahead and build backends with it. There's a lot more services I didn't get a chance to show today, or container services, so you can take advantage of Docker, you can take advantage of sort of the richness that microservices provides. Uh, you can take advantage of data and analytics. I showed off the NoSQL capabilities. You can take advantage of SQL as a service. You can take advantage of rich hybrid capabilities for networking and data exchange and integration across lots of different systems uh, and a whole bunch more. But hopefully you kind of saw throughout all this experience, there's a really easy way that you can build apps uh, using Azure. It doesn't take a lot of code. It doesn't take a lot of new concepts for you to be able to take what you already know and be able to stand it up in the cloud and be able to scale it out in a, in a global, trusted, hybrid way that can run all over the world. And the combination, I think, of building great mobile experiences and building, taking advantage of great cloud-based infrastructure hopefully is going to make it really fun for all of us in this room to build applications over the next decade. And I look forward to seeing all the great systems you built. Thanks again for coming out here this morning into the event. Talk to you later. <laughs>